Chapter forty six of the Mutiny of the Elsinore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mutiny of the Elsinore by Jack London. Chapter forty six. Four more days have passed. The gale has blown itself out. We are not more than three hundred and fifty miles off Valparaiso, and the Elsinore, this time due to me and my own stubbornness, is rolling in the wind and heading nowhere in a light breeze at the rate of nothing but driftage per hour in the height of the gusts in the three days and nights of the gale we logged as much as eight or even nine knots what bothered me was the acquiescence of the mutineers in my programme they were sensible enough in the simple matter of geography to know what i was doing they had control of the sails and yet they permitted me to run for the south american coast more than that as the gale eased on the morning of the third day they actually went aloft set to gallant sails royals and sky sails and trimmed the yards to the quartering breeze this was too much for the saxon streak in me whereupon i wore the elsinore about before the wind fetched her up upon it and lashed the wheel Margaret and I are agreed in the hypothesis that their plan is to get inshore until land is sighted, at which time they will desert in the boats. But we don't want them to desert, she proclaims with flashing eyes. We are bound for Seattle. They must return to duty. They've got to soon, for they are beginning to starve. There isn't a navigator aft, I oppose. Promptly she withers me with her scorn you a master of books by all the sea blood in your body should be able to pick up the theoretics of navigation while i snap my fingers furthermore remember that i can supply the seamanship why any square-head peasant in a six months cramming course at any seaport navigation school can pass the examiners for his navigators papers that means six hours for you and less if you can't after an hour's reading and an hour's practice with the sextant take a latitude observation and work it out i'll do it for you you mean you know she shook her head i mean from the little i know that i know i can learn to know a meridian sight in the working out of it i mean i can learn to know inside of two hours strange to say the gale after easing to a mild breeze reproduced in a sort of afterclap with sails untrimmed and flapping the consequent smashing crashing and rending of our gear can be imagined it brought out in alarm every man forward trim the yards i yelled at bert rhine who backed for consul by charles davis and the maltese cockney actually came directly beneath me on the main deck in order to hear above the commotion aloft keep her runnin and you won't have to trim the gangster shouted up to me want to make land eh i girded down at him getting hungry eh well you won't make land or anything else in a thousand years once you get all your top hamper piled down on deck i have forgotten to state that this occurred at midday yesterday what are you going to do if we trim charles davis broke in run off shore i replied and get your gang out in deep sea where it will be starved back to duty we'll furl and let you heave to the gangster proposed i shook my head and held up my rifle you'll have to go aloft to do it and the first man that gets into the shrouds will get this then she can go to hell for all we care he said with emphatic inclusiveness and just then the fore t gallant yard carried away luckily as the bow was down pitched into a trough of sea and when the slow confused and tangled descent was accomplished the big stick lay across the wreck of both bulwarks and of that portion of the bridge between the foremast and the forecastle head bert rhine heard but could not see the damage wrought he looked up at me challengingly and sneered want some more to come down it could not have happened more apropos the port brace and immediately afterwards the starboard brace of the crowjack yard carried away this was the big lowest spar on the mizzen and as the huge thing of steel swung wildly back and forth the gangster and his followers turned and crouched as they looked up to sea next the gooseneck of the truss on which it pivoted smashed away 
Immediately the lifts and lower topsail sheets parted, and with the fore and aft pitch of the ship, the spar upended and crashed to the deck upon number three hatch, destroying that section of the bridge in its fall. All this was new to the gangster, as it was to me, but Charles Davis and the Maltese Cockney thoroughly apprehended the situation. "'Stand out from under!' i yelled sardonically and the three of them cowered and shrank away as their eyes sought aloft for what new spar was thundering down upon them the lower topsail its sheets parted by the fall of the crowjack yard was tearing out of the bolt ropes and ribboning away to leeward and making such an uproar that they might well expect its yard to carry away since this wreckage of our beautiful gear was all new to me i was quite prepared to see the thing happen the gangster leader no sailor but after months at sea intelligent enough and nervously strong enough to appreciate the danger turned his head and looked up at me and i will do him the credit to say that he took his time while all our world of gear aloft seemed smashing to destruction i guess we'll trim yards he capitulated "'Better get the sky sails and royals off,' Margaret said in my ear. "'While you're about it, get in the sky sails and royals,' I shouted down, "'and make a decent job of the gasketing.' Both Charles Davis and the Maltese Cockney advertised their relief in their faces as they heard my words, and, at a nod from the gangster, they started forward on the run to put the orders into effect." Never, in the whole voyage, did our crew spring to in more lively fashion, and lively fashion was needed to save our gear. As it was, they cut away the remnants of the mizzen lower topsail with their sheath knives, and they loosed the main skysail out of its bolt ropes. The first infraction of our agreement was on the main lower topsail. This they attempted to furl. The carrying away of the crowjack and the blowing away of the mizzen lower topsail gave me freedom to see and aim, and when the tiny messengers from my rifle began to spat through the canvas and to spat against the steel of the yard, the men strung along it desisted from passing the gaskets. I waved my will to Bert Ryan, who acknowledged me, and ordered the sail set again and the yard trimmed. "'What is the use of running off shore?' I said to Margaret, when the kites were snug down and all yards trimmed on the wind. Three hundred and fifty miles off the land is as good as thirty-five hundred, so far as starvation is concerned. So, instead of making speed through the water toward deep sea, I hove the Elsinore two on the starboard tack with no more than leeway driftage to the west and south.' But our gallant mutineers had their will of us that very night. In the darkness we could hear the work aloft going on as yards were run down, sheets let go, and sails clued up and gasketed. I did try a few random shots, and all my reward was to hear the whine and creak of ropes through sheaths, and to receive an equally random fire of revolver shots. It is a most curious situation. We of the high place are masters of the steering of the Elsinore, while those forward are masters of the motor power. The only sail that is wholly ours is the spanker. They control absolutely sheets, halyards, clew lines, bunt lines, braces, and downhauls, every sail on the fore and main. We control the braces on the mizzen, although they control the canvas on the mizzen. For that matter, Margaret and I fail to comprehend why they do not go aloft any dark night and sever the mizzen braces at the yard ends. All that prevents this, we are decided, is laziness. For if they did sever the braces that lead aft into our hands, they would be compelled to rig new braces forward in some fashion, else, in the rolling, would the mizzen mast be stripped of every spar and still the mutiny we are enduring is ridiculous and grotesque there was never a mutiny like it it violates all standards and precedents in the old classic mutinies long ere this attacking like tigers the seamen should have swarmed over the poop and killed most of us or been most of them killed wherefore i sneer at our gallant mutineers and recommend trained nurses for them quite in the manner of mr pike 
but margaret shakes her head and insists that human nature is human nature and that under similar circumstances human nature will express itself similarly in short she points to the number of deaths that have already occurred and declares that on some dark night sooner or later whenever the pitch of hunger sufficiently sharpens we shall see our rascals storming aft and in the meantime except for the tenseness of it and for the incessant watchfulness which margaret and i alone maintain it is more like a mild adventure more like a page out of some book of romance which ends happily it is surely romance watch and watch for a man and woman who love to relieve each other's watches each such relief is a love passage and unforgettable never was there wooing like it the muttered surmises of wind and weather the whispered counsels the kissed commands and palms of hands the dared contact of the dark oh truly i have often since this voyage began told the books to go hang and yet the books are at the back of the race life of me i am what i am out of ten thousand generations of my kind of that there is no discussion and yet my midnight philosophy stands the test of my breed i must have selected my book out of the ten thousand generations that compose me i have killed a man steve roberts as a perishing blonde without an alphabet i should have done this unwaveringly as a perishing blonde with an alphabet plus the contents of my brain are the philosophizing of all philosophers i have killed this same man with the same unwaveringness culture has not emasculated me i am quite unaffected it was in the day's work and my kind have always been day workers doing the day's work whatever it might be in high adventure or dull ploddingness and always doing it never would i ask to set back the dial of time or event i would kill steve roberts again under the same circumstances as a matter of course when i say i am unaffected by this happening i do not quite mean it i am affected i am aware that the spirit of me is informed with a sober elation of efficiency i have done something that had to be done as any man would do what has to be done in the course of the day's work yes i am a perishing blonde and a man and i sit in the high place and bend the stupid ones to my will and i am a lover loving a royal woman of my own perishing breed and together we occupy and shall occupy the high place of government and command until our kind perish from the earth End of chapter forty six